Thanks, Jane. Hello and welcome to the program. Tonight, we uncover the hidden dangers of microwave ovens. Plus, we meet South Australia's new age nomad who's managing to survive on a pittance. But first, the South Australian Medical Boards released its long-awaited report on the performance of the state's former chief forensic pathologist, Dr Colin Manock, in the controversial Henry Keogh case. While Keogh's lawyers weren't surprised the board dismissed their complaint, they say many of the issues they raised simply weren't addressed. The board itself is under increasing pressure over its own failures to take appropriate action in a series of cases, the latest drawing severe criticism from the state coroner. And as Graeme Archer reports, Keogh's lawyers say they will now appeal the matter in the Supreme Court. The reasons for the decision are exactly what I expected. They were disappointing and perfunctory and they haven't dealt with the issues. I was shocked by how superficial the judgment was and how after all the effort they'd made us go to to particularise the complaints that they utterly failed to deal with them. Yet again, the medical board has failed to find any sign of its own pulse. Well, Dr Manick was a pathologist and a pathologist has to be a registered doctor. The medical board's responsibility is to ensure that registered medical doctors act in accordance with the highest standards of the profession. So their job was to make a judgment about whether Dr Manick had done that, particularly in relation to the Keogh case. Today, after much delay, the board handed down its findings on the professional competence of Dr Colin Manock, the state's senior forensic pathologist from 1968 to 95 based upon his work in the Henry Keogh case. They have the powers to appoint an investigator to go out and investigate things and look at things and ask questions. They've never appointed an investigator and no investigation has been done by the medical board at all. Predictably enough, the doctor was given a clean bill of health. It was made easier for the board that Dr Manock's work was limited to people already dead. One of the more famous pathologists in the country, the head of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, said that he couldn't think of another pathologist in the whole of Australia that would have conducted themselves as Dr Manock did. As author and lawyer Bob Moles and this program have revealed, contrary to today's report, there are scores of examples of Dr Manock's flawed forensics. Back in the 1980s, his finding in the Emily Perry case almost sent an innocent woman to jail for 15 years and the High Court was scathing. One of the judges in the High Court said that the forensic work that had been done in this case by Dr Manick represented an appalling departure from acceptable standards. And as I said before, that's, that's no minor criticism, is it? Was there any official follow-up to that criticism? No, there wasn't. So in a sense, sitting in judgment of Dr Manock, the board was also sitting in judgment of themselves. Oh, absolutely, and we made that clear to them at the outset. Behind each bizarre finding is a human tragedy, the most poignant being the deaths of three babies in the early 90s. All suffered from severe injuries, but according to Dr Manock, all died from natural causes. A subsequent coronial investigation found his work to be incompetent and his errors scuttled any chance of criminal charges being laid. There's never been any official reaction to this scandal, but it provides a powerful clue to how unsatisfactory the board's report today really is. Was the medical board prepared to hear evidence about those baby death cases? No, it wasn't. And they said at the very outset that it would be quite inappropriate for Henry Keogh to raise what we would call similar fact evidence, and that is evidence of previous shortcomings by Dr Manock in the baby deaths cases and in the many other cases that we've referred to. That's right, after refusing to hear evidence on the baby death blunders, they selectively quote from the case to support their own findings. Trouble is, they chose to quote Dr Godfrey Ottle, whose opinion on the case was discarded by the coroner. The coroner said that in so far as it bore any resemblance to the evidence that he had heard in those baby deaths, it was simply inapplicable, it was wrong. So effectively, the medical board have used a discredited report which supports incompetent work to justify their decision. Yes, the expert report that had been rejected by the coroner in a matter that we were not allowed to refer to 
was brought in by the board as the only way of justifying Dr Manick acting in accordance with proper standards. The board also make the startling judgement that his standard of work should be measured by that of those working with him. Given there was only one other full-time pathologist, it's hardly representative of international standards. The medical board also said that there weren't any proper national or international standards at that time. They may have changed a little bit, um, but we're not talking about the dark ages here. Their approach to the disputed thumb bruise claimed by Dr Manock to be proof of a hand grip and claimed by the DPP in the case as the one positive indication of murder is equally bizarre. If the bruise couldn't be seen using a microscope, as Dr Manock admitted, but told no one, that didn't mean that it didn't exist. It simply doesn't make any sense at all. The procedure was that they'd taken, or said they'd taken, some tissue from what looked like a bruise and examined that under the microscope. It then didn't show any signs of bruising. Well, in normal scientific circles, you will say that that had falsified the hypothesis. In other words, the claim that there was a bruise has now been proved to be wrong. What Dr Manick said was that it simply failed to confirm the existence of the bruise, but nevertheless the bruise existed because he saw it and because he could point to it on a rather grainy black and white photograph. One of the main criticisms of Dr Manock levelled at him by interstate and international experts was his failure to rule out other possible causes of death. Not a problem, says the medical board. But they said that because Dr Manock had a practice that wasn't set out in the textbooks, because it was supported by his peers, meaning by the, the other pathologist there who was his subordinate, then that justified his methods. As we've shown, there are many, many fundamental problems with the Keogh prosecution, to the point of there being insufficient water in the bath to make the Dr Manock murder theory even physically possible. And Dr Manock admitted as much to the board, a point they seem to have missed. We asked him, did you check the level of water in the bath at the time? And he said, no, I didn't. And we said, well, the bath was only one third full and that can be established from the photograph of the water in the bath. And he said, oh, well, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have put forward the, the drowning scenario. There are over 40 particulars of a complaint and hardly any, were, hardly any of them were dealt with in this uh, report. They then said that they would consider um, Dr Manock's conduct in performing the autopsy and they said they would consider Manock's, Dr Manock's conduct in giving evidence at the murder trial. First they hardly mentioned and the second they did not even mention at all. Henry Keogh's counsel, Kevin Borick QC, says the findings are totally deficient. But what really stood out in my mind was that they said that in 1994 there were no established standards for best practice in forensic pathology in South Australia, but then said that Dr Manock complied with those non-existent standards. Of course, the medical board itself is under a darkening cloud for the way it's handled its own duties, leading a current parliamentary select committee to effectively threaten members to be more upfront. Failure to answer questions is considered a very serious matter, and the committee seeks your cooperation in providing the information that it requires to fulfil its inquiry and report to the Legislative Council. While medical boards around the country have been put on notice by the catastrophic lapse in quality controls following the doctor death case in Queensland, it appears the board here have failed to get the message. But then it has a long history of denial. If the doctor is displaying over behaviour, would be picked up like that? Well, what about the case of Dr Stephen Raybone, for instance? I don't know about that. I think you would. No, I don't mean you were the president of the board when that case went through, didn't it? Former President Ross Colusi seemed to have forgotten his supervisory role in the case of Dr Stephen Raybone, who was alleged to have infected over a dozen patients with hepatitis C while injecting himself with their painkillers. Raybone was allowed to continue practicing despite a chronic drug habit. He was reinstated by the board, went to Barmara and started injecting himself with his patient's medicine. Now, in that case, why would the board allow someone like that to go into a hospital? You're not going to mention his name. Well, he's in the courts. It's no, been well, in the I papers. Won't, I won't take part in that discussion. 
And just a few weeks ago, the coroner blasted the board for their inactivity over the Dr Stephen Marrow case after the death of one of his patients and evidence of his drug abuse. But I say it gets down to how no, 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 the board no. performs Stop in individual cases. Stop them. Or else I'd walk out. Okay. Well, let, OK, no, let's, no, no. let's change let's the... Stop the chemistry. You're right. What happens sometimes is that these boards and committees and things, maybe they, they don't do their job properly and, and there may be all sorts of reasons for that. But the public know the difference between right and wrong. The plan from the Keogh side is now to challenge the board's decision in the courts. We have the right to go to the Supreme Court to seek judicial review. And there are a number of uh, uh, precedents for that. And you'll and do that's that? What, and that's what we will be doing. There's no prospect that this issue is going to go away. There's every prospect that it will lead to a royal commission or to a major investigation to find out why it is that we seem unable to face the truth in relation to these prior acts of um, misconduct. Graham Archer reporting there.